How many of y'all are having to battle to stay on top of positive thoughts about what's going on? How many of you are having to work at having hope? And I'm not talking about hopium, I, although I don't believe that hopium is a bad thing. How many of y'all ever heard of that expression? It's just false things that make you feel good about yourself. But see, isn't that exactly what Abraham did when it came time to sacrifice? He had hopium. It wasn't the true thing. He made up a fictitious narrative and told himself, the boy's going to be okay. We're going to come down that mountain. And it happened not like he thought. But we're going to talk today about the importance of that hope. Father, in Jesus' name, I ask for you to give us the words this morning, Lord. Let them come through me to them, Lord. Father, we ask for the change that only your precious spirit can bring this morning. Father, let transformation happen in this place. Let transformation happen in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Daniel 7, 25. Everybody agrees that even though it was talking about the times then, but it's also in reference to what's going on right now. And it's talking about the Luciferian system that is in place in the place where we call home. And it says, he shall, talking about Satan, shall speak great words against Elion, against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, shall wear out the saints of God. How many of y'all, every time you ask somebody how they're doing, they tell you how wore out they are? <laughs> how many of y'all have found that to be just the way it is? If you're going to do it tired or it ain't going to get done? shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and to think to change times and laws, are we seeing that done? My goodness, look at some of the things that are legal now that you would have been put in jail for just a few years ago. And look at the time-changing stuff. I think we've all about had it up to here with that, haven't we? Yeah. And they shall be given into his hand. I'm talking about the deceitfulness is going on right now until a time and times of, and the dividing of times. I don't know what that means, but I think it has a lot to do with that that I've been saying for the last two years. And that is we are at the end of something and we are at the beginning of something. Something is winding down and something is taken off. And we're sort of caught between the two. But I'm telling you, we're going to go with God. We're going to be okay. How many of y'all going to go with God and be okay in this thing? So many of us have personal concerns and just so much stuff on our plate. We haven't got time or we don't have room in our mind to give any thought and concern about the evil that is, I mean, right before our eyes, we are watching evil destroy our way of life, and in a lot of cases, destroying our lives. But we've got so much going on at a personal level, we don't have a lot of energy and time put into seeing what's going on. We hadn't got time for it. It's like this. We don't want to know. And it's like this. Let, let's, let's just get, I got enough problems without worrying about the worldwide situation. I think that's exactly what's going on now. The Bible indicates that God expects us to find out what we don't know. He leaves it up to us. It's always going to be up to us, y'all, everything. And ever, it's one of these repent things. All through the Bible, the New Testament, the theme is repent. It means change your mind. You're thinking one way, but you've got to learn something else. Paul said when you renew your mind, then the transformation happens. That's when you change your mind. You have a change of your mind about God, about how this system is op work, set up to operate, and what your part is in, this, in the overall plan. Everybody has a part in the plan. Everybody, and if you don't do your part, I'm telling you, God will move down to somebody else to take it over. We've seen it happen in this ministry so many times. The second one says, I can't go no more. God has another one ready to tag team and jump into place of it. It happens all the time. And ignorance of that is no excuse. The Bible tells us that the people perish, or my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. So we understand it's up to us. We have a God-directed command to find out what's really going on, to ask, seek, and knock. And then when you get an answer, change your mind, repent. Metanoia, your, your, know your knowledge. Meta, change your knowledge, change your mind about it renew our minds. And then God expects us, once you see 
what's going on and you find out the reason we need truth, the reason he sent the Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth is because we have been deceived for so long and at such a depth, the deception has been controlling our lives without us even realizing it. And when God expects you, once you see the level of deception that's going on, you're supposed to do something. You're supposed to speak up. You need to understand that we are right now in an information war that begun with, back in the 50s with Operation Mockingbird. And it's been going on ever since then. It's, a, it's an information war in order where truth is fine, trying to bust through the half century of lies that have been told to us at least and now truth is breaking through and the liars are being exposed and they don't like it one bit so they're, they're trying to put out as much stink as they possibly can. They're killing, stealing and destroying like never before. Do y'all see that we're in an information war? You see that? That's what it is. It's who's telling the truth. If it lines up with God, that's who's telling the truth. If it doesn't line up with God, it's a lie. It's just that simple. And I'm talking about the God according to Jesus. Amen? Y'all know what I'm talking about. So many people are needing hope about personal stuff, personal issues, family, financial problems they're going through. They don't have enough room on their plate to take on the problems of the world. But I'm telling you a little secret I found out. When you begin to give your attention to what's going on out there and finding out what your part in the change is, then God will take care of those personal issues on your plate. I tell you all the time, just go to Psalm 91, consider that your contract with God. If you do what you know to do by giving him all your attention and all your time and your study and your thoughts, and I'm not talking in a religious way. I'm not talking about reading the Bible through in a year. I'm talking about asking, seeking, and knocking, and allowing God to put people in your path that's going to show you what you need to know and show you where you need to go and what you need to do. Y'all get that? God uses people. Everything. Faith comes by hearing. How are they going to believe unless one be sent? It's always going to be faith comes by hearing a man. And it's not necessarily somebody behind one of these things. I learn more from people with a microphone and an iPhone than I do from most preachers. It's people that are listening to the Spirit of God and showing what is being revealed to them. And then as I repent and I begin to see what my part is in this overall plan, then I look back at the little things that were worrying me and Susie, and they seem to be being taken care of even while we're not paying that much attention to them because we're so locked in on what God is doing. Colossians chapter 1, Paul is writing to the church at Colossae in Asia Minor, and he's praising them. He's, he's giving them salutations for the fruit of their faith and their love for their fellow man. And beginning in verse 9, Paul says, For this cause, because y'all have got so much fruit coming forth from you, since that day that we heard about it, we don't, we don't cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Same thing God wants for you to be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom. Wisdom is what you know to do. That is the, the, the thoughts of God, the, the, the beliefs of God, the, the ways of God, and spiritual understanding, the same thought, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work. Everything you set out to do is going to work. It's going to succeed. And increasing in the knowledge of God. We don't know it all, folks. It's, it's a mystery that we enjoy the, the trip. It's not certainty that we got nailed down with tent stakes. It's always increasing, ever increasing faith. And it says here, increasing in the knowledge of God. You will never, if you ask, seek, and knock until you take your last breath, you ain't going to even scratch the surface of everything about God. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. I ain't going to be much of it. I got to rely on my strength for, for might according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. 
all patience remaining the same, not being moved by what's going on. Where did I lose my place? Long suffering, that means putting up with people, places, and circumstances. And uh, why are you laughing? <laughs> Long suffering. I think we all know what that means. Oh, God, here they come again. <laughs> with joyfulness. Remember in John 15 last week we were reading where Jesus said, all this stuff I'm saying to you is that so that my joy might remain in you and your joy might be full. He wants us to be happy, folks. This should be the place you come and have the least of your worries, not bothering you one bit. You should leave here with a smile on your face and that smile should continue till you walk in next Sunday. It's up to us to rejoice. Amen. Giving thanks unto the Father which has made us able to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. We are partakers in something good. And I'm going to tell you what it is in just a minute. And this is what God has done. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. It doesn't say who is going to deliver us from the power of darkness and will someday, maybe later on, translate us into the kingdom. No, the kingdom is within you. The kingdom is right now. The kingdom is at hand. We have been delivered from the power of darkness and we have been translated. Without dying, we will move from darkness to the kingdom. Kingdom. That's powerful, folks. Boy, I brought this scripture up last week and it popped up this week. Not that part, but where I'm going to get to in just a minute. In whom we have redemption through his blood, Jesus, even the forgiveness of, of, of sins. I'm going to tell you why that's necessary in a minute. Why is it necessary to have forgiveness of sins? It's not about God. It's about what we think about ourselves and our relationship with God. Who told you you were naked? Always remember that. Who told you something was wrong between us, Adam? Okay, you think you went and made them fig leaves. Let me make you something a little better, at least last through the winter. You got to think of it like that. God looks at us the way we look at us. And he meets us where we are, and he goes along with our foolish ideas about him. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you. In whom we have the redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin, who is the image, talking about Jesus, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, and we're in there. For by him were all things created and all, that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers, all things were created by him and for him. That goes along with, with, with John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and everything that was made was made by him. Was nothing made that was not made by him? Amen. For all things were created that are in the heavens, that are in earth, visible and invisible. There's more going on that you can't see than you can see. I'm telling you, there's a lot going on right now. There's a battle going on that we can't see. But thank God we're on the right side. If you're on the right side, don't let the enemy use you on his side. A lot of folks are on God's side, but they're being used by the enemy and don't even realize it. That's for another day. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. That will give you a little clue as to don't worry about it. God's got it. Amen. No matter how evil they might look, God somehow has got something going on there. And, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body. Jesus is the head of the body, the church. Everybody that is a part of his body, raise your hands. We are his body. And he is the head. He's the head. We're the body. You got, and it ain't just somebody flop, head flopping around on top of No, his body's able to stand up and walk and change things in this world. Because we have him as the head. That's the preeminent one. And he brings that up in just a minute. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things, Jesus, he might have the preeminence. He might be number one, and he is. And he is our leader. He is our thought. That's why we have to renew our mind. 
We have to see things like God sees them. And you can only do that by seeing things like Jesus sees them. For it pleased the Father that in Jesus should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself by him, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Now, who did the reconciliation? He did. He fixed. What does reconciliation mean? It means he fixed what was wrong. He balanced the books. He dropped the charges. He did whatever it took to bring us our righteousness. We became the righteousness of God in Christ. We were made that way. He became sin for us. He that knew no sin became sin so that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself by him, I say whether they be things on earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometimes, here we go, this is why I've got an important part about the forgiveness of sins through his blood. That you that were sometimes alienated, that means you blocked off from him and you think that you think he don't want nothing to do with you. And enemies in your mind by wicked works. Get a grasp of what this means. Y'all have heard me quoted a million times. There's three of y'all. I say it all the time. There's the public you, the, the private you, and the secret you. And what I'm talking about has to do with the secret you. The things that the enemy will use that he knows about you. He was there when he saw you go to that website. He saw you think those lustful thoughts. He understands all these things that we keep to ourselves and we don't tell anybody. But he will make you think that they're holding something, that it's holding something between you and God. That's where you, your mind gets, you're alienated and enemies in your mind because of stuff you know about yourself. The enemy don't even have to know about it. We're real good at beating our own selves up. Amen. Are we not? Amen. Y'all scared and don't know where to amen me on these because <laughs> it's going to sort of point the finger at you, ain't it? In the body of his flesh through death, that's how, the, how it happened, how we got to be reconciled, to present you holy, say, I am holy. I am holy. And unblameable, say, I am unblameable. And unreprovable, say, unreprovable. You know, that word is almost like the one before it, unblameable. It means blameless. It means even though you're unblameable because there's nothing in you that could be blamed. When somebody blames you, it don't care no weight with God because he knows you're blameless. Amen. I'm blameless. Yes. I know those secret things about Standing Boy that y'all don't know. But he takes those things and puts them in the depth of the sea. He removes them as far away as the east is from the west. He don't, he, you bring them up to him, you say, what you talking about? Why are you bringing that up? Who are you talking about? That don't make any sense. We're blameless. Amen. Isn't that a good thing? Uh, then comes a huge two-letter word, if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, the good news, which you have heard. I said this last week, it's in the Bible, and it popped up with me without me looking for it. Which was preached to every creature which is under heaven. Which was preached to every creature which is under heaven. Didn't the Bible say something about after it is preached to every creature? Then we're going to see some things happening. Well, it says here, which was preached. How can we believe that it was? I mean, it's what we got. How many, how many two billion Christians? Well, I showed you week before last, every one of the major religions has as its main proponent, the main thing that they're concerned with is the golden rule, doing unto others that which you would like to have done to you, treating others the way you want to be treated. It's, it somehow got it. It somehow got everywhere, didn't it? And I told you that wherever people are hungry for God, no matter what it looks like, God will circumvent and get in there and answer. He's God. Come on, y'all didn't put him in a box and block, locked him out of church. It's silliness. 
if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, wherefore I, Paul, am made a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, to fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Everything that's done is for me and you, folks, so we can, we can walk about knowing that we are unblameable, that we're unreprovable, that we are blameless in the eyes of God, that everything is all right. God will never love us any more. He'll never love us any less. He loves us just like we are because he is love. That's the way it's always going to be. And he's talking about hope. If you move, be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. Not talking about the sweet by and by. He's talking about the rotten here and now. That's where we need it. As I say also, all those things that the word salvation needs, healing, you don't need no healing there. Ain't no sickness there. No sickness and disease, no, no tears and there's tears of joy. Amen. The gospel is good news. Good news, part of which is we have been translated. We have been moved by God himself to a safe place of healing, abundance, joy, protection, mm, all of the things that are wrapped up in that beautiful Greek word, sozo. We have been moved to that kingdom. Now, right now. Well, I mean, you might, not, you might live on, on Tift Avenue. You might live in Doublegate. You might, might live, no matter where you live. You truly live in the kingdom of God. You reside in the kingdom of God. The kingdom is everywhere you go, you take the kingdom with you. Amen. He is in you. Amen. Think about that. It's up to us. He tells us not to be moved away from the hope of the gospel. It's up to us not to be moved from this safe place in our minds. God knows that I'm doing my best to do my part to help keep you there. I talk about hope all the time. I talk about faith. I talk about believing for the good things. I believe about, I talk about patience. I talk about all of those things to try to keep us. I'm trying, I'm keeping myself there too, to be not removed, to be grounded and settled. You know, think about the way that sounds. Grounded and settled. Grounded, grounding takes on a whole new context now. Now, right now, we're just discovering the importance of being grounded. I'm talking about physically into the earth. Do y'all know anything about that? Susie and I have been grounding about three years now. We bought a sheet that plugs into the the, um, grounding rod of our house. It goes to the wiring system, and we sleep on that. Go outside, take your shoes off, and be grounded. Let that electrical force that comes down from God through your brain and through the earth, I don't know what it is. But this whole thing takes on a whole new meaning to me now, talking about being, being settled and grounded. Also, just think about it. Everything's okay, man. I can't be moved. Everything's going to be okay in my life because I know the gospel. I know the good news. And I have been trying. I don't live there. It might look like I live there. I might be going through some stuff right now, but watch me go through the stuff right now and watch me come out on the other side of that healed or come out on the other side of it, prosperous or whatever it is I need. It took, if, if you were to take everything in the Bible, everything the Bible says about the hereafter, says about the, the next part of our existence after we die and we go to heaven, if you were to take everything about the afterlife out of the Bible, you wouldn't miss it because there's hardly anything in there. But if you took everything out of the Bible that has to do with the way we conduct our lives while we're here, you take it out and you ain't got much left. What has church done? We centered up on getting everybody a ticket to heaven and, we, and the certainty of these 13 tenets that we have, whatever our group, ever how many our group has, and that's what we talk about over and over and over. We talk about faith over and over here because faith comes by hearing and hearing. I know the importance of, of, of talking about these things over and over. And one thing, I have to hear them myself. I believe me before I believe you. We're going to talk about talking to yourself. How many of y'all talk to yourselves? You all do. Mm. Well, folks, you got to understand... I'm just an old mess who 43 years ago, wanting to honestly die, I was so desperate. 
I found out some stuff. And now it's almost like my only contentment in life happens when I am telling somebody these things. I thank God. We talked about that, uh, about ivermectin and ivermectin for a couple of weeks, and I'm still getting people call me that don't go to church. And I'm, I'm just, uh, there's a lot of us still doing this, and we're not talking about it right now because it upset people. People do not want to be moved from their comfortable place. And man, this is some of the best news I've seen since we've been believers. But I, 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 somebody called me the other day, we talked for about, what, about an hour, I guess. I just poured it into him, and I just felt when I got off the phone, I told Susie, I feel like I'm doing what God wants me to do. What am I doing? I'm giving hope. I'm giving hope for, for a new day, hope for a healthy, long life. Psalm 91 ends with, says, he will show you his salvation and satisfy you with long life. Amen. How many of y'all want to go long life? Yeah. How many of y'all want to go to heaven? Yeah. Are you, how many of y'all in a hurry to get there? <laughs> we want long life, don't we? The ministry, this ministry, it was prophesied before we even had our, our, our first service by Elaine Smith called me one night, and I was sitting out by a little pond I dug in overlooking the river when we lived on the river. And she said, I see it in the spirit that this ministry is going to be an instructional ministry. And that's, my, that's really what it's been. I didn't know what, I had no idea what was going to be going on. It is. And I show you these things and I lead you to Jesus and I, I give you the sayings of Jesus and how me and Susie apply them in our lives. But it's up to you. It's always been up to you and it always will be up to you. You can start a prayer chain from here to Timbuktu and back. You can get everybody on Facebook praying for you. You can get your mom and daddy and all them praying for you. It's still going to be up to you. Amen. Be it unto you according to your faith is the words of Jesus, not some slick back, fancy dressing preacher. Slick back? <laughs> What'd that mean? I was thinking of hair slick back, and I was thinking of shiny britches. Yeah. It breaks, it truly breaks mine and Susie's heart when people come to us and they've got thus and such problems, whatever they are, and we know what they need, but we also know they're not going to accept it if I tell them. It happens all the time. It, it hurts me so bad. It, my heart, I'm talking about, not my feelings hurt, it just when, when I see people miss out on what he's saying through me as a vessel in this, in this ministry as pastor, as the one that has the grass that you should be eating. Um, this was his idea. This was not my idea. This doesn't say anything of me talking about that. doesn't say anything about me. The gift always points to the giver. It, it's never a pat on my back for any of this stuff. And it's all in spite of me. And, and God, I've got so many issues in my own life, I'm, I'm amazed that God uses me, you know. And I mean, I ain't out sinning and running the, the I just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm like everybody else. I'm a mess. And I admit that I'm a mess. Y'all don't admit that y'all are a mess. Oh, goodness. Well, I, I'm, 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 I'm take umbrage with that. I'm not a mess, Pastor. I, are you Richard Nixon? How come you're doing him? Oh, I'll take some I wish, I've said this so many times, I wish I could reach in my pocket and hand it to you, but it's always going to be up to you. The fact is, and this is the truth about everybody's life, you are receiving in life exactly what you are expecting to receive. You might not realize that, you might not understand it, you might not notice it, but you are, or, or what you're hoping for. That's what Job, 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 God was there to look after Job and take care of him. Made him the wealthiest man on the earth. Man, he, was, he had a lot going on. But he was off into doubt and fear and where his expectation was is what happened in his life. 
and he had to do some adjusting. He had to do some changing of his mind, and he did, and the, and the latter part of Job was better than the other. I mean, it came out, it worked out. It'll always work out, amen? Whatever you're expecting is where your hope is. Hope is the blueprint of our faith. Hope is the blueprint of your future. Think about a blueprint of a house. You know, you've got your building your house and got your bedroom and you show it to somebody and say, look, this is our bedroom right here. And see how we got the bath, it goes right into the bathroom. We got two toilets in there. Ain't that cool? Got two toilets in the bathroom. Boy, that's a good idea, isn't it? But when you're telling somebody, you're showing them the blueprint, that's your house. And you mean it. And you know one day you're going to walk in full life size and that place is going to be there. That's the way faith is. Hope is that blueprint. It's what you meditate on. It's what you think all the time. And when you're moved away from the hope of the gospel, the good news, then that hope becomes a dread of bad things to happen. There's nothing else. It's no just flat. You're either thinking, yes, it's going to be okay, or God, it's going to be a mess. Am I speaking to anybody? Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Fear is is the substance of things dreaded mm-hmm. or the way, where your hope is. I mean, if, if, I, I say this all the time. Fear and faith is the same power. Hope and dread is the same power. Fear and faith is the exact same power, but they're operating in reverse. And it's the way that the enemy who has no power, he has been stripped from power, and we have been removed from that power, from that kingdom of darkness, Right? We have been taken away from that, and the only way he has access to any power, and I'm talking about the enemy, is tapping into the source that God has given you and getting your tongue under his control, getting your mind, your thoughts, your fears under his control. And then he's got you. Not me. He had me for 30 years, and he played me like a cheap violin. I did whatever he brought, whatever he said, I would run after. Any kind of new drug, I would, come on, let me give it a shot. Anything destructive, I was running into wide open. It was like a yo-yo, up and down. Just everything was a mess. But I realized no longer will I allow him to have any part in my life. I have been removed from the power of darkness, and I have been translated into the kingdom of God's dear son. I'm not in there alone. He's in there with me. Ain't that good news? The reward, we have been moved by the powers that be right now. This is, this is a sad thing. We have, by the powers that be in our realm that sort of lead the sheep around, we're now in a place where without the wisdom of the thoughts of God to make proper life decisions and choices, we have come to a place now where we will mold ourselves toward the evil and we'll get to the place where we do whatever we want to do, whenever we want to do it, without any thoughts of the consequences, without any thoughts uh, of the reward or consequences that these choices might, may, might bring to our lives. I, that is a saying in, um, I think I've talked about this before, in recovery programs. That is, you're thinking about doing something, you're tempted to do something, play the tape. In other words, run the memory of the last time you did that and see how it turned out. That's a good thought for everybody. Play the tape and see how how, how'd you do last time when you're making a life choice, when you're uh, making a choice about an evening, about a night out on the town. And there's nothing wrong with going out on the night. It's a good thing to go out and have a good time. I believe that with all my heart. Uh, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the the evil that man does. It's everywhere now. And that it just it's like a hook in your jaw that will lead you around everywhere you don't want to go. And when you live an unenlightened and an unrestrained life, which I did for 30 years, doing whatever you want to do whenever you want to, then you become enslaved to those things. But thank God we've been removed. Amen. 
we have been removed from the power of darkness. Remember the first page of the Bible, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over this place. That's given us authority. Never was it taken back. He, ne he never took it away. He delegated it to us then. Now, Satan dealt it away with that deal in the garden. But then Jesus shows up. And he makes another covenant, a new covenant with better promises. And he pulls us into it. And that's where we are now. Now we can take back dominion. Even though we never lost it, now we have the power to enforce it. We have the exousia, the authority over these things in our lives. Jesus' followers are referred to as disciples. And that's where we get the word discipline. The two weeks that I talk about so often that change our life, I, I don't talk about the first week a whole bunch. That first week, I went to detox for the last time. And this is back when detox was in some old boarding house over on Tift or Residence or somewhere. And I really was, I, went, I was in there, I went in on a, I played Saturday night in Moultrie. Let me tell you about my, my playing jobs. Nobody would play with me anymore. My, I, was such, I, was, I was a blackout drinker for years. And, and, and anything else I had. I had one job playing. Thank Wally Walker. Dave Walters gave me a gig. Me and Terry Stuff were playing a little trio working every Saturday night at the VFW in Moultrie. And I made $80 a week. Now that was it. That was the, our income. That was it. $80 a week. And so what I would do, I, would, so I played every Saturday. I would stay in bed on Saturday because I'd be nauseated and sick and need to be drinking so I could get through the job without messing up. <clears throat> and I would take one pint of vodka with me. That's what I would take with me in, in my briefcase where you keep all your important stuff. And I would take that with me and I would allow myself, I would allow myself one drink before I left the house. That would calm down my shakes a little bit and where I'd be able to talk normal way. And then I would allow myself that and I would drink it and I would be able to get through the job without messing up. Well, I came home that night that Saturday night, beginning of the two weeks, Robert Carter drove me down to the detox center on whatever it was. And, they, and by then, man, I had, I had taken, when I got home, I was so scared about going to detox. I started taking a bunch of pills, a bunch of um, um, benzos. And I took so many, I really, the whole thing is a blackout to me now that first day in detox. And I went down there and I stayed. I was supposed to stay, I think, through Saturday. But I had to get out that side, that next that Saturday because I had to play down in Moultrie again. And that was the first time I'd played in years sober. And Susie went with me and Robert's wife, Debbie, went with us that night. Uh, and I was so terrified to play sober. It was just, and it, it went good. But that place where I spent the week in detox, it was mostly with, with street people. And I'm telling you, I discovered, I saw myself, I, at the young age of 30, was in the same boat that these people were in. I, my, it was just as advanced in my life as it was in these people, and a lot of them were 50 and 60 years old. And it showed me where my life was headed to. And I got out on that, and all of this was God-led, and I didn't realize it. We'd been, I'd been watching the 700 Club for a good while. I'd been praying the prayer with Ben and Pat, prayed it over and over and over, wanted to make sure that God heard it. I didn't, you know, I didn't know nothing about nothing. But I just knew that they seemed like the, the God that they were talking about might even have something to do with filthy, rotten me. And I began to believe that. And so that's why I was set out. I'd come to the place. I made the decision to make the decision. And I was, if I had to sew my lips shut to keep from drinking, I was going to do it. That's how determined I was. I was taking an abuse. I went and got a prescription for that from a psychiatrist, same psychiatrist who was giving me my Valium prescriptions. Man, they had them run, had a running prescription for that. I was, God, what a mess I was in. And all that stuff left that week. That Saturday night, I went down and played. That Sunday, Herman Lloyd called me up out of the blue and, and said, man, I, uh, I'm in a mess out here. Um, my piano player done took drunk again, and I, I'm going to have to let him go this time. I need a piano player. And I said, well, Herman, I'm playing with Dave. I, I said, let me, I'm going to have to talk to him and get out of it. And I hated to do that today, but I, this was a way I could support my family. 
And I ended up from that, in that two-week period, the second week, I started Tuesday night playing with my idol, Big Ernie Soul, man. He was, Ernie was, was my man, and I was working a trio with him out at the nicest supper club in Albany. It was a Lloyd's Fine Food, an awesome supper club. It's been gone for years now, but it had two sides to it. It had one side with entertainment and, and family eating, and then the side that I played in was like the nice lounge and restaurant where you had to have reservations, and you had the, um, a group playing there. And I, I sat down for one year out there behind a grand piano and not, have, not drinking and, and getting my feet on the ground. We had, he gave me a raise. Herman knew, knew my reputation. He said, I'm going to give you, I think he said two strikes. I don't think he said three strikes. He said, I'm going to give you two strikes. If you mess up, you're gone. And no, in fact, he gave me a, a raise right after I got, he, he said, he said, I'm going to bump you $25 this week. He said, and I'll tell you what, in about a month, I'm going to bump you again. He never did the rest of the time out there. But I, I was waiting for that next bump. But, <laughs> but anyhow, Herman's going on to be with the Lord. I loved Herman. He'd show, he, he would call me late Sunday nights. He would call me up and we'd talk for hours. But it was, it was a great year in my life. The reason I'm telling you that is that's what God can do in a short amount of time if you'll just believe and have hope that he can do it. My hope had been built up by watching those, those, those programs on uh, 700 Club. Man, I would watch them at night. That's why we had a VCR so I could tape those things and watch them at night. I, I had a determination for self-discipline. I knew the drinking days when drugging days had to be over. But I knew full well that my will was not enough. My discipline was, it was going to take a power that was greater than my, what I could do and greater than what my mom and daddy could do or what Susie could do. It was going to take the power, the very power of God for me to be able to enforce that discipline that I was trying to take over my life. I consider myself a disciple. I consider myself one that has learned over the years with the help of the Holy Spirit to discipline my choices and actions. It's what we're all called to do. Amen? Yeah. It's self-discipline, but with the realization that you got to have God to, to do it. You know, as a scripture in Proverbs 8, verse 12, it says... Wisdom dwells with prudence, and find out knowledge of witty inventions. I, that ran our life for years, witty inventions. When, whatever group I played in, we worked. Why? Because I knew what songs we should play, and the people I worked with, me and um, drummer, throwing the blank. Brent? Me and Brent this morning were talking about that. Uh, you got to play with what the folks want, not what you want, you know, and we always did the right thing. When I started the ice cream business, I loved it. I had my own ice cream truck and I absolutely, oh God, I got to talk about people about Jesus. I got to, it, I felt like I was just shining all day long. I was happy. I was just having a ball. But there were people all over town, especially in the summertime, that would come from Columbus. And these were folks that weren't playing by the rules. They didn't have business licenses. They probably didn't have commercial insurance. They were not collecting and paying sales tax. I was doing all of those things. What am I going to do? God showed me what to do. He showed me how to make my own ice cream. How to, I had a popcorn machine that I'd bought several years from the Slappy Drive-In Theater. It, we would make 50-pound bag of popcorn in like an hour. It was huge. I was selling at one point every day two black trash bags of, of, of popcorn for a quarter a bag. Two of them. We were doing, I, I, he was giving me witty inventions, showing me how to do it. The other, the other ice cream drivers, they just didn't even try to ride my routes anymore. If I drive up behind them, they would leave. I'd pull over and everybody would come to my truck because God gave me witty inventions. And I'm telling you right now, if God hadn't called me to do this, you'd hear me ding a ling up and down Fifth Avenue right now. <laughs> I loved it. You know, I helped a lot of other people get in, people that were like me, musicians that had been approaching 40 about that time and didn't have anything to fall back on. And I got several of them in the ice cream business, helped them find coolers and trucks and things. 
<clears throat> and every one of them that got in it just loved it. They were so happy. But every one of them that got in it fell away after about six weeks because if you cannot discipline yourself, you have to work for somebody else who will discipline you. That's one of the things about being your own boss. You have to get your ass out of bed in the morning. You have to get to work whether you feel like it or not. You have to say, no, I'm, I, I, I know I'd rather stay in bed. No, if, it, if, it, if, it ain't, if you ain't out there doing it, it ain't going to get done. And that happened with so many people. I would get them in bed, and they loved it. I, mean, you know, I got cash in my pocket. Man, I'm just doing so good. Next thing, I'm not seeing them down at, at where we'd buy some of our supplies, not running into them, not seeing them on the street to speak to them and blow horns at each other. And what's going on? Oh, well, Mama's riding through in my truck now. I just got where I didn't, didn't want to do it. I'm telling the truth. You've got to be able to dis discipline yourself if you're going to be any kind of success in this life. You know that, Deborah. Early on, I'm about through, y'all, don't worry. Susie and I latched on to the power of hope over 40 years ago, and we arrived at the place where we've been ever since then where we always have hope of increase, a hope of healing, hope of winning, hope of everything working out. That's what we came to. We were there. No matter what it looks like, somehow everything is going to work out for the good. We're going to wind up on the other side of this in better shape than we are right now. We have come to the place. Y'all see me? You see what I have had to go through with, with the local Christianity community? We have come to the place where failure is not an option. You know, talking about witty inventions. Tommy and Wendy's business, Tommy Max, that's why they are a success. God showed them things without them even realizing God was showing them things. What to do and what not to do. Let me tell you what happened last week. Last week, a church bus came from another town. They wanted to go to two places. They wanted to go to Radium, and they wanted to go to Tommy Max. Now, that says a lot about somebody running a business, doesn't it? <clears throat> Witty inventions. I, I meant to bring it up a minute ago. It's just so cool. Tommy will tell you right now, we don't know what we're doing. He just, he just sort of fell into it. Wow. How many years ago? If, how many? 25 years ago. If y'all have never been out there, it's at Lancaster Village. If you've never been, go give yourself a treat. It's just an awesome place with awesome food. And Wendy's all just constantly in the kitchen making things that folks, did. that's such a demand. She, she, she can't make as much as people want. Her chicken pot pies are gorgeous. Y'all saw all them strawberries she did for. I'm talking about God, y'all. I ain't talking about Tommy and Wendy. I'm talking about witty inventions, amen. They're, they're at the place where failure is not an option. How many of y'all are at that place in life? I will succeed at what, whatever I put my hands to shall succeed. We have that promise. Amen. Everybody is either there or you're, um, it probably ain't going to work for me. You're either one or the other. There's hardly no in between. Well, we just have, when you say, I sure hope so, what you're saying is not those words. Your attitude and your inflection is saying, this probably ain't going to work. When you say, I sure hope so, your inflection is saying, this ain't going to work. That's what your spirit is saying. That's what your spirit is. Get a hold of that. That's for somebody. That's for me, maybe. Doing life the Jesus way requires self-discipline hooked up to divine hope, the hope of the good news. And understand the ability and the power for that discipline comes from above. And when I say come from above, I could have said come from within. Because he's in us. I mean, it ain't like God's up there. You understand that, don't you? He's not the man upstairs. He's in another realm that we can't see. That's that, those invisible things created by Jesus. And the Bible tells us that he, we were in him from the foundation of the world, and he dwells in us, and we in him. Hmm? So, the, I mean, you can talk about it's above, but it's also within. 
So how do you do this? How do you, how do you stay from being moved away from the hope of the gospel? By submitting to the Lordship of Jesus. It's the only way you can stay right there, grounded and settled, not moved away from the hope of the gospel, of the good news that Jesus came to bring, is to submit to his Lordship. He said, don't call me Lord if you're not going to do what I say. But if you do what I say, I'm your Lord. And then when the storm comes, you're going to be in good shape because you dug deep on being a hearer and a doer of the word. How many times have you heard this in a church situation, you're watching on TV or out of church, you've been in church services where, or somebody's come up to you on the street and handed you a little booklet and said, have you made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life? (laughs) How many of y'all have ever, everybody's heard of that, haven't you? (laughs) Making Jesus Christ the Lord of your life is not something you say. It is something you do. Where's the camera? Making Jesus Christ the Lord of your life is not something you say. Mm -hmm. It's something you do. Now, the Bible tells us that with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation, but he's talking about getting your tongue talking in line with that word, the Greek word sozo, healing. Mm -hmm. So, with the heart man believes, with the mouth, confession is made unto sozo, the Greek word. That word means healing, protection, preservation. Wealth, prosperity, not having a lack, being made whole, to be set at one again. In other words, back to the factory reset, back to Genesis 126. That's pretty cool. Mm. Making Jesus the Lord of your life is, is, is something you do, and it's everything you do, and it's everything that you attempt. You know it's going to be a. Pat Robertson had a. Um, a plaque on his desk I heard one time, and I don't care what you think about him. I know that he got me, saved me from, from dying at an early age. Um, he had a plaque on his desk, I remember, and it said, attempt something so big that it is destined for failure without the intervention of Jesus. Amen. That's the way Jesus becomes our Lord. It's a position we assume. It's a position that we accept. It's the way you live. It's the way you allow yourself to think. It's, it's where you allow yourself to go, who you allow yourself to, to, to be in fellowship with. It's the way you instruct yourself to think, the way you instruct yourself to talk, the way you instruct yourself to hope, what to hope to believe, the way you treat people, all of those things are tied up with the Lordship of Jesus. It, it, it's not telling people or believing about yourself that you're all a bunch of miserable sinners and God just can't wait to get his hands on you and kill you if you don't jump through some hoops. He loves us. Yes. He loves you so much. It's understanding, comprehending, waking up to, and using the power of God that is part of our nature. Wait a minute. You mean part of my nature is, is the power of God that, that includes, includes being able to see people get healed, seeing people be delivered, seeing people's life turned around? Remember, He is the head and we are the body. You have that power in you. Do you believe it? Walk in it. There are great benefits into living under the line of authority that was delegated through Jesus, just like we talked, learned last week. It comes down through the veins of the plant. Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. And then we're to continue that flow into every body that we have anything to do with. Just a simple loving them the way you want to be loved. That's gospel. That is good news. Good gracious alive. I love this stuff. Talk about, we'll get out of here with this one. I asked you a minute ago if you talk to yourself. Have you ever listened to what you say to yourself? Good, I, I come to get nasty with myself. I don't mean dirty. I mean, I, I fuss at myself a lot. It's sort of like what David was doing in Psalm 103. 
He said in verse 1 of Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul. He's talking to his mind, his will, and his emotions. He's saying, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. You need to tell yourself not to forget his benefits. What are his benefits? He lists some of them right here. Who forgives all of thine iniquities, who heals all of thy diseases. Don't forget. Talk to yourself. Tell yourself that you're healed. You're not sick. Who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. Ooh, this one takes on a whole new meaning, meaning for me since about November, December of last year. Who satisfies thy mouth with good things so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. Yeah. Did y'all get anything out of that one? Yeah. I did. Do what David did. Tell yourself, you are the healed, you're not the sick. You're above and not beneath. You're the head and not the tail. Yeah. You don't come behind. Do what David did and do what Jesus did. Do what Jesus said. The Jesus', Jesus says wine story when he showed up and they ran, ran out of wine and folks were already drunk. That's another part of that story that's been ignored, and I like that part of that story. Um, but his mama said, Jesus, do something. He said, Mama, come on. My time ain't yet. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll do something. And his mama said, whatever he says, do it. Why'd she say that? Because she knew that his words worked. For the book of James centers up on the importance of the power of our own words. He, he was there. He was Jesus' half-brother. He, he understood the power in words. Him and his mama both understood that. You need to understand that. That's another part of being under the lordship of Jesus is fully understanding that when you speak his words, you're going to produce his power in your life. Mm. I love it. I used to hear folks, I hadn't heard this in a long time, back when I was doing faith every week. Well, well, what what, what if I try this and then I fail? Well, that means you tried something else. Because this can't fail if you do this. It ain't something you try, so it's the way you live, you know? If you fail, you obviously believe something else because what is you're experiencing in your life is exactly what you are believing for. Whether you ever even realize it or not. I've told you the story a hundred times about me and Pete Stiff in his office one day, and a guy came in and said, well, my, my granddaddy died at 57, my daddy died at 57, I'm 52 now, I mean, I, I'm just... He wasn't scared, but he had convinced himself. And I didn't look, I ain't looked it up. See, if I bet you he died at 57. You know, we get what we expect. And so if it doesn't work in your life, it means you're believing something else. Or you're double-minded. You're doubting. You're doubting. Uh, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let not this man think he will receive anything of God. It's always going to be up to you. Yes, God can sovereignly come down and boom, poof you a new car when you need it. And I've seen him do those things. When he does those things, that's an act of his sovereignty, and it's for his will usually. It's usually going to have something to do with his will that will keep you carrying out your will for other people. But we're not to depend on his sovereignty. We're to depend on the faith that he has given us. He's dealt to each of us the measure of faith. And it's what we believe and what we speak. That's what we're to depend on. Double-minded man is unstable. You have to keep yourself there. Even though we've been removed from the evil power, we will spend eternity with God. We understand that, don't we? If your beliefs, if your mind haven't been renewed, you'll keep yourself under the control of the world. You'll be conforming to the control of the world, and the prince of this world will have his way in your life. And even though you go to church and you read the Bible and you pray, you're going to wonder why you're having such bad luck. Why are things going so bad in your life? It's because that's what you believe in you're going to get. You're expecting it. You spend more time studying on that than you do studying on God's healing virtue, which is freely given. Amen. Folks, the the enemy has been stripped of his power. Praise God. 
yet he still has success by hijacking ours. He ain't got mine no more. Did you get anything out of this? Yeah. I got more, but I'm out of time. This is real, y'all. We're in a real war. We're seeing death rates go through the roof worldwide. I don't know where that is with men between the age of 20 and 60. It was up 40%. That was a year and a half ago. That's insurance. And that is, has nothing to do with COVID. So pump that in there and see what it adds to it. You know, it's things are going on. The, the, the thief is killing, stealing, and destroying like never before. But the church is being called to stand up under the headship of the Lordship of Jesus and do what he says in these days and know that you're going to win. Don't give place to the devil. Give no place to the devil. Don't give him any opportunity to get a toehold. He gets a toehold, he's going to wind up with a stronghold. Well, I just a little bit. Just a little bit. Just one time. One more time. Just one more time. One more, one more time. Well, I played those games for years. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your precious word. Thank you, Father, that you are continuing with us in your kingdom, Lord, as we have been removed from the power of darkness. Thank you, Father, for the reconciliation that we have, that the books have been balanced, the charges have been dropped, and we are in good right standing with you, our Father. Father, continue to speak with us and lead us this week, Lord. Let us produce some fruit that we're conscious of this week so by this time next Sunday we can think back over the week and see something that produced good out of our life because of your Lordship. I love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, amen, amen, amen. amen.